Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, coming. I think this is going to be a really fantastic event with amazing speakers. And uh, joining us tonight as a moderator, we have uh, Michelle Usta. Michelle is a master's candidate in our conflict resolution program. And Michelle is going to introduce our two speakers and, and moderate as well. So, uh, hello, I'm Chantal Berman, professor mm -hmm. in the uh, Department of Government and Conflict Resolution. I do see some familiar faces. So please help me welcoming Michelle. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, Going on kidding for those who celebrate. And I'm sorry that the food uh, came before the thought. Um, so, welcome and thank you for joining this event of the 2019 revolutions in Lebanon and the current uprisings in uh, Iran. Um, we will provide dinner after the event or during, uh, you know, when a talk happens, I feel free to go and get some food and uh, come back. Uh, tonight's event is co-hosted by the Conflict Resolution Program, which is in the Department of Government and the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies. Uh, my name is Michel Osta, like Professor Berman said, uh, and I'm a Conflict Resolution student here at Georgetown. And I'm honored to be moderating this event. Please allow me to introduce our guests, uh, our panelists for tonight's discussion, Dr. Dima Majid and Dr. Muhammad Ali Kutibar, who unfortunately is not feeling well and is uh, joining us over Zoom. Uh, Dr. Dima Majid is an assistant professor of sociology at the Sociology, Anthropology, and Media Studies Department at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. Her work focuses on the fields of social inequality, social movement, sectarianism, conflicts, and violence. Dr. Majid has completed her PhD at the University of Oxford, where she has conducted research on the relationship between structural changes, social mobilization, and sectarianism in Lebanon. Additionally, Dr. Majid has, has conducted research on the 17 October Revolution in Lebanon and has participated as an organizer of many of the protests during the Lebanese Revolution. She is currently a research fellow at the Middle East Initiative at Harvard University. She is also the co-editor of the book, The Lebanon Uprising of 2019, Voices of the Revolution, from the Revolution. Dr. Muhammad Ali Kadivar is an assistant professor of sociology and international studies at the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences at Boston College. His work contributes to political and comparative historical sociology by exploring the causes, dynamics, and consequences of protest movement. Dr. Kadivar holds a PhD in sociology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and has served as a postdoctoral fellow at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. He has experience as a participant observer of the pro democracy movement in Iran, and he is researching the current protests in Iran following the murder of Mahsa Amin. Dr. Kadivar is currently working on a paper titled The Internet, Political Process, and Grievances in a Way of Anti Regime Protests in Iran. And he has recently published a book titled Popular Politics and Path to Durable Democracy. To start off, Dr. Kadivar and Dr. Majid will give us an, an overview of the protests in Iran and Lebanon before answering some more specific questions and taking QA from the audience. Thank you all again for joining us. And let's get started with an overview of the current uprisings in Iran. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here with you virtually. And I'm sorry I can't make it, I couldn't make it in person. I just got sick and it wasn't possible, <laughs> possible for me to travel. Um, so I will give you an overview of the, uh, the background of the recent protests in Iran. My focus would be on the women life freedom uprisings or Gina Amini protest uprisings. These are, I think, the two names that have been used the most for this wave of protest. I, I put, I tried to put them in the con broader context of protest in Iran and broader social, political uh, conditions and configurations. So just to start with, uh, can talk about two types of protests in Iran, social protests and anti-regime protests. Social protests are the type of protests in which often a, a, a clear group of people, mostly workers, professionals, teachers, um, nurses, truck drivers, so on and so forth, they protest about particular demands, which is often raising their wages or uh, they protest privatization of large uh, enterprises um, or they protest being laid off as a result of pr uh, privatization. 
these type of protests happen pretty much every week in Iran. And uh, they usually don't escalate their demands and they don't ask for the regime change. The demands are often very specific, as I mentioned. And then since uh, we have that, have, since 2007, December of 2017, we have had uh, the breakout of a few cycles of anti-regime protests. In this type of protest, people have asked for uh, the fall of the Islamic Republic. They, uh, they chant slogans against uh, Ali Khamenei, the Iran's leader, against the clergy, uh, against the main symbols of the regime. And we have had, I think, three national waves of protests of this type uh, since December of 2017. We have this type of protests have had have uh, also occurred before, but not with such a, a breadth and geographic uh, the diversity as I will show. <laughs> so this is a figure of the what I call social protests. You can see this is like the, every month. Uh, the number of the total number of this type of protest, a large number of them are protests by blue collar workers, and the other ones are by other type of professionals such as nurses, teachers, and also sometimes uh, protests against uh, environmental degradation, against uh, being laid off, and so on. So this shows the number of protests that has been reported in Ilna, which is an Iranian news agency that has the broadest coverage of this type of protests in Iran. And this second chart shows the number of uh, districts or counties that have had protests, at least one protest at a month. Iran has uh, about, Iran uh, has 429 uh, districts in the last census that was conducted and more administrative units has been added since, but uh, everything I'm presenting here is based on the latest census. So to take a look at the anti-regime protest that I mentioned, the first one was in 2017-18. It lasted for 10 days and above 80 districts uh, had a protest. The turnout in these protests uh, between tens of people to thousands of people, uh, we estimate. And uh, the regime was able to suppress this wave of protest. Um, they killed 22 people. And after 10 days, they ended the protest. The protest started uh, by first, uh, actually by hardliners within the regime as a, they wanted just to make the situation uh, bad for uh, the moderate president of the time, Hassan Rouhani, but then the protest escalated and uh, the anti-regime opposition in diaspora started putting out calls for protest. And this was a way of protesting which internet uh, uh, played an important active role in coordinating the time and location of protest. Then in 2019, we had a bigger uh, episode of protest, which uh, broke out after a sudden hike in the gas prices. More than, uh, I think about 98 uh, districts had protests. These are all based on original data that I have gathered with my colleagues, and I'm happy to speak more about the, the, the procedure. And uh, the, the government's uh, reaction this one, this time was much more violent. So the lowest estimate of people who were killed by government forces is more than 300 people. And then we also have a number of 1500 uh, people in only one week. So even if we take the small, the lower number 300, that's a very large, that's a very bloody crackdown. <clears throat> So I wanna highlight four uh, contextual elements that has made this type of uh, protest episodes to break out more. We haven't, in, uh, this is since 2018, it's over five years. But if you look at the five years before that, you didn't have such a phenomenon, this frequency of anti-regime protest. Why is this happening more now? Uh, I think one reason is decline of representativeness of the, of the regime. Uh, Iran has held, the Islamic Republic held elections that were to a degree competitive, at least between the uh, insiders of the, the regime, but they were not fair and free because everyone wouldn't uh, run for elections. Nonetheless, they were competitive and because of the competition, some of the factions, moderate factions or reformist factions, they often tried to 
articulate some of the demands of the middle class, bring it within the regime discourses and push for it. But these uh, projects failed. Hardliners really resisted uh, the both the reformist reform movement and then the moderate uh, presidency of Hassan Rouhani. And many people who voted for those, those candidates uh, became completely disillusioned that there's any chance of reforming the regime from within. Uh, on the side, in peril with this, we have had increasing repression. I, as I mentioned, the uh, 300 people that were killed in November 2019. And there were other smaller waves of protests that the government has responded with an iron fist, uh, killing protesters, arresting protesters. Even before this wave of protests started, there were many activists, uh, journalists, human rights activists, environmental activists that were in prison. The third, uh, factor is increasing corruption. It's impossible that you open a news website every, any week and you don't find a news about embezzlement, uh, corruption. These are even cases that go within the government's judiciary. So the highest officials that have been indicted is the vice president of uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, who is in prison uh, right now. And the current speaker of the government, uh, the parliament, Ali Buff, also has an open case of uh, corruption and embezzlement documented by Tehran Municipality Council, but because he has close ties with uh, Ali Khamenei, of course, it's no problem for him. And finally, we have seen also a decline in effectiveness of the regime of the state. They're just delivering policies. So a major example was during COVID when Khamenei announced that the government shouldn't uh, import uh, British and American vaccines. And they basically delayed vaccine import because they were trying to uh, produce vaccines within the country and make profit off of it. They even got paid for it. Uh, one of the, the Parzital uh, satellite in state institutions that are under how many Iran's leader. So they received the money. They never produced the vaccines on time. So then they imported the vaccine. Uh, and this this resulted, this just delayed result, resulted in uh, tens of thousands of excess deaths. If they had imported vaccines earlier, the evidence shows that they could have saved more lives. But also these deaths were blamed on the government. So because of this, I think that this is why we see the breakout of this anti-regime uh, episodes of protest. So coming to Gina Amini, uh, Protests, uh, this shows the daily number of protests that have happened from over uh, from September to uh, November and, and, and December. We stop at December because protests continued, but much smaller and more scattered place. Uh, so we see that there were protests, large number of protests. We, on the peak days, we have had more than 200 uh, protest events. And these are even these are the ones that are reported. Of course, this doesn't probably cover all of the protests. And uh, we had sit-ins and strikes. So this, uh, the number of strikes are small, but it was the first time a wave of anti-regime protests had strikes. And it was the first time that anti-regime protests overlap with social protests. So some of the professionals and some of the blue collars workers joined the Gina Amini protests and uh, had uh, strikes or uh, held their own protest events. This uh, chart shows the number of districts that had protests on each day. And again, you see this is a sustained, this has been a sustained wave of uh, protest mobilization in the country. This shows the map of the districts with the number of protests uh, they have had. And in total, there are, we have counted uh, 185 districts have protests. This is almost twice the last uh, protest episode, which is 2019. So the length of the episode, the last two were seven days and 10 days. Now we have had at least three months of sustained protest, if I'm not counting the smaller ones afterwards. And uh, yeah, here in this map, you can just compare and see that how in each uh, the number of districts that have protested has increased over time from, to, from this basically 2018 to 2023. So this has been the big part of this has been women, of course, subjugation of women and women's body. It's been about the protests started against the mandatory hijab. We have had women non-movements in the country when basically women, def has def women have defied 
compulsory hijab in their daily day to day uh, just acts of living. And they have been harassed and uh, persecuted at times by the government, but they continue. There has been smaller protests also against the compulsory hijab. Uh, what is interesting is that the first recent protest that we had, public protest, was one woman who held her headscarf. It was during the 2017, 18, 10 days protest period that uh, we, we saw open acts of resistance. It took five years for that individual. It was only one person who did it on that, uh, on that period, which, I mean, we know who she was, and she. this is a lot of bravery. It took five years for this to turn to a full-fledged movement. Groups that participated, of course, women have been at the forefront uh, of this movement. Uh, youth also, young men and young women. We know also this from the people who were killed during the protests, many young people in their te te teens and 20s. We have had the participation of ethnic minorities. I know it's one of the questions, so I'll wait for that to talk about it more, but mostly Kurds and Baluch participated. Students, college students and high school students. There were even some videos from elementary school girls who were taking off their hijab and were shouting women life freedom. And for the first time we had workers and professionals and I know this is one of the questions, so I'll uh, get to it later. Uh, demands of the women, I mean, clearly one of them is just women rights, just let women live and uh, that the state shouldn't interfere with how women dress. But this becomes part, uh, part of uh, a, a broader, I think, theme that I probably need to have here. And that's liberation of life. Just the fact that is, the Islamic Republic has tried for 44 years to impose a certain practice and ways of living, way of living to Iranians. Part of it is hijab, part of it is all the other restrictions they put on uh, posing even for men in terms of entertainment, uh, music, movies, production, so on and so forth. Protesters have clearly asked for the end of the Islamic Republic in their slogans. Um, as I said, the, I think minorities have been quite active and so they have been wanting more voice, more recognition of their problems and policy making that would give them equal voice, equal rights. And also political liberties, democracy and human rights also have been among demands. People have asked for their right to protest, their right to assembly, their right to four groups. I uh, stop here and then I know there are a lot of questions I will get. I'll, I'm happy to elaborate on any of this, even the question and answer. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, <clears throat> so next we have uh, Ali. Yes, Ali. Uh, thank you so much all for being here and uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be discussing this with you and uh, I'm sorry, Ali, you're not here, we're, we're, you're missed. Um, so I'm going to uh, be talking about the uh, Lebanon uprising. Um, and I mean, there's so much to say about this uprising, so I'll try to make it in, uh, in 15 minutes and stop me when I need to stop. So uh, just a bit of background, uh, about the surprising and how it started. And as you can see, but this is part of a bigger research project, a book project that I'm working on. And um, you know, I, I call it an uprising against sectarian neoliberalism. I'm happy to elaborate a bit more uh, on that. But yeah. great. So so to get started, I mean, uh, why is it important? There are so many uprisings uh, happening around the world. Why should we uh, look at, at this case? Of course, every case is interesting, but I think there are a few issues around the Lebanon uprising that uh, that, are, um, uh, that make it a relevant case to think about other cases as well. Uh, so first is the fact that Lebanon is probably the first neoliberal country in the world. Uh, so if we decentralize, uh, the Western genealogy, and I know the term neoliberal can be contentious, so we can discuss this more. Uh, but it, uh, we're thinking in terms of deregulating markets. Uh, you know, usually we talk about rolling back a welfare state. Well, Lebanon never had a welfare state to roll back from the from the get go. The, there was no so unlike the region, unlike the Arab region, uh, where the post colonial struggles have brought in uh, uh, regimes that had big. Uh, 
uh, uh, states, Lebanon went in an opposite direction. And unlike the rest of the world, and after the Second World War, when the whole world was shifting to Keynesian uh, economics, uh, Lebanon was the bank of the region. Uh, it was uh, it was an economy that was from the get go, uh, uh, you know, what, what today we would call neoliberal. Um, so, and, and why is this important? Because uh, I, I don't know if you're following, but the World Bank has issued a report last uh, month saying that there are many economic crises around the world. The one that keeps them up at night is Lebanon. So, <laughs> so there might be some food for thought there. The second reason is uh, Lebanon is part of uh, you know, these revolutions that uh, we're starting to see more and more in the 21st century. And these are revolutions or uprisings in democratic settings. And the literature tells us that revolutions should not happen in democracies because there are other channels to change, right? People can vote, people can, uh, 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 you know, it doesn't need to escalate to, to an uprising, but still we see this happening. And the first wave of Arab uprisings was mainly in uh, authoritarian settings. So the, so the literature was mainly focused on democratization, right? So Lebanon and Iraq are the two cases that, that are a bit more complex uh, when we think about what does it mean to change a regime that is supposedly already democratic. Uh, the third reason why this is important uh, is that uh, the literature after the first wave, after 2011, was telling us that a revolution will never happen in Lebanon because it's sectarian. Right, that the minute it starts, it will become a civil war, and and uh, uh, it's it's very unlikely that it would happen. So, uh, and and this is where I'd like to to think uh, more about the intersection between those two structures: the economic structure that we can call neoliberal, or you can call it whatever you, you want, uh, and the sectarian uh, political uh, uh, system that is in place, and how these two have come together to create that revolutionary moment. Um, the fourth reason I think this is a, a, a <clears throat> one common setting for what we would think of in terms of counter-revolutionary forces. This is an uprising that was very short-lived because it was very quickly met with a number of uh, you know, world-scale events, a global pandemic, and uh, not every revolution is met with a, a global lockdown. Uh, a a, a world-scale financial crisis and of course, the October 4th uh, uh, explosion, that, um, that was a major turning point. So let's see. Okay, so a bit of background uh, uh, and uh, just the structure of this talk. So I'll start by very quickly giving a background. I'll then talk a bit about uh, how the revolutionary situation was created, who mobilized, why, how, and where. And this is based on uh, um, a survey that I ran during the first week of the uprising. Uh, so I, I moved very quickly, <laughs> and an event catalog uh, uh, of uh, protest events that that, uh, that that we have collected. Um, I'll focus on two uh, uh, other things. The first one being the repertoire of tactics and how it's shifted, and uh, the second one being the question of organization. I think. Uh, probably, uh, you know, in dialogue with, with Ali, and for both of them, I'll highlight the importance of labor uh, and, and how things unfolded. And then I'll end with uh, a discussion on demobilization and the counter revolution. Okay, so in 2019, the system shook. Uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the uprising uh, started very unexpectedly in Lebanon, uh, as like every other uprising. Uh, but the, the background for that specific year uh, was, uh, th that was a week of heightened uh, uh, anger because of uh, wildfires that had ravaged um, uh, uh, many parts of the country. So there was, it was, so it happened in the context of an environmental crisis where people were already very angry. The state could not, the government could not respond to it. And Lebanon had to wait for Cyprus to send us helicopters to control the fire. So it was, you know, the discussion about corruption uh, uh, was back to the surface and people were angry. But if we look a bit, uh, you know, the, the month before, Summer of 2019 was a month of uh, uh, mobilization in the Palestinian camps in Lebanon uh, that uh, we often forget about when we talk about the uprising, but it's important to, uh, to highlight the, the effect of the financial crisis. So the crisis started to be felt at the beginning of 2019, and it's mainly the groups that are the most marginalized in society that feel the crisis first. So in summer 2019, the Ministry of Labor 
the Minister of Labor uh, uh, introduced new laws uh, curbing the rights of Palestinians to uh, uh, access jobs or work. Uh, and that created a, you know, a, a lot of mobilization that lasted for around two, two to three months. Um, so this is, this is the context was uh, a summer of uh, discontent, wildfires, and then on October 17th, the government met and passed uh, a new uh, new taxes. The one that was picked up by protesters was the tax on WhatsApp. Uh, and uh, this is when people started to mobilize very quickly. Uh, within hours, it started in Beirut within hours spread uh, uh, everywhere in the country. So if we, if we zoom into that revolutionary uh, week or day, and if we look at, so who are these early risers? Who are these first mobilizers that created the revolutionary situation? So based on the data that we I collected, uh, what we see here is that so most of those who are mobilized at the beginning are actually people who uh, had voted for the same sectarian political parties they are rising against uh, just a, uh, less than a year before because Lebanon had elections 20, 2018. Um, and uh, when we asked them whether they supported parties, also almost half of them said that they used to support one of those uh, sectarian parties. Um, so this is to say that the, it's the political constituent, it's the base of these parties that actually mobilized uh, at the beginning. If we look at the composition in terms of class or, or employment, uh, so what we see here is that the majority are either unemployed, or students and wage earners, uh, or self-employed. And most of them, uh, around 62% of them are in the informal sector. Uh, what is striking in this, and the result here is, is this number, uh, which tells us that public sector employees almost did not mobilize, although they form around 15% of uh, the, uh, the labor force in Lebanon. Uh, again, this is, we can explain this more, it's probably linked to clientelism and networks of who gets uh, hired in, in, in uh, public sector uh, employment. Now, just a few facts about, so the employers, almost 68% of them are under the age of 35, so very young. 42% uh, of them have only attended public sector schooling, so that, in term, so this means they're not the the bourgeois kids who went to uh, private schools. 96% uh, have never traveled to study abroad. 92% uh, have never traveled to work abroad. So this goes against what we think of the Lebanese as, you know, people are traveled and uh, studied abroad and etc. The majority of them had uh, uh, low income, uh, generally below $1,000 uh, on average. Um, most of them reported have, uh, having debts, so their income does not uh, meet their expenditures. And what is important here is that around 80% 80, 80 of the protesters reported not having any form of uh, healthcare uh, coverage. So not the uh, 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 NSSF, the government, uh, uh, social security or private insurance, uh, which becomes important because COVID is coming up, right? Um, Another thing, uh, also interesting finding from the from the data is that uh, Beirut was the place where it started, but it was not the place where most protests uh, happened. So if we see, so the arrow is Beirut is the as the bar in gray, uh, and if we see the beginning, it was my mainly the first month was Mount Lebanon, and then Tripoli, and then Beirut, and we see that as we move on, Beirut becomes the center again in February when a new government was formed. So when the political process went back to the institutions, this is when the capital became the center again. Uh, before that, we see a spread across uh, the governorates and the demands are uh, very much around socioeconomic rather than political. Towards the end, it's more political. <clears throat> okay, so how did this uh, unfold? Um, so the main tactic that was used at the beginning was uh, was this. So barricades, roadblock, road blockades, and uh, you know, so people will just show up, a few of them, and and uh, uh, close the streets. 
what this meant, and when I, I did a lot of interviews and I asked people, why did why were you blocking streets instead of going to the square and protesting? Um, the answer is always something around, we wanted to bring the country to a halt. We wanted everything to stop. And it was intuitive that if you want to ch like a drastic change, you need to stop everything, right? Um, so, so this went on until the second week of November. So almost three to four weeks. Uh, and what came with it was an, an, an unannounced general strike. So people were not going to work, people, and this actually is what created the big squares because people were not going to work, they were going to the squares. And it opened way for a, a flourishing of thousands of new groups or organizations that, that were created uh, ad hoc on the spot. So these were, did not exist before. Uh, and they're trying to organize it during these uh, first few weeks, so here. But then what we see is a start of demobilization. Of course, it's nothing new. Every, every wave will eventually have a decline. Uh, people will not stay in the streets forever. But this was very much linked to uh, going back to work, the end of the, of the strike and people having to go back to work. Uh, so we start to see, of course, there are peaks. And I'm happy to talk about when it picked up again and why. Uh, but the general trend is that after once the strike stopped, we see a general trend of decline. Uh, and what this has created for the uh, activists and, and people I, I worked with and I talked to is, uh, you know, this uh, recurrent theme of we became part-time activists, right? And that we're fighting a full-time regime. But once we're back to work and we all have to do different jobs to make ends meet, uh, we became, you know, our, our revolution became, you know, an hour after work. Uh, or a, a few hours on the weekend, if, if, if we can. Um, and so, you know, it became, it became an activity rather than activism. And many of them were also making the distinction between activism and militancy, that they couldn't, it wasn't, they didn't see it anymore as a form of militancy. Now, if we look at how the repertoire of uh, tactics have shifted over the, the whole three years, I'm sure you've probably seen this photo uh, uh, a few months ago. And the money high scene that that is uh, that we're seeing in Lebanon a lot. Uh, so we see this. So the shift is we went from tactics that are disruptive, so physically closing down and and not letting people arrive. We moved to tactics. So so if if we look here, this period in between here and here, it was mainly um, tactics that I call expressive. So people mobilize, but to mobilize on a Sunday afternoon, you know, families with kids to express something, uh, but not to disrupt. And then after COVID and, and the pandemic and when the situation uh, got really bad, what we're seeing is tactics that are sort of restorative, but individual rather than collective. Mm -hmm. So these are individuals saying, I want my, my money back. Uh, they're not collectively mobilizing for a, a, you know, a broader cause. Uh, the demobilization is also, of course, uh, you know, affected by the counter-revolution that took many shapes. Uh, one of them is, is fatigue or uh, attrition, and the regime played this game very, uh, very well. And we see that the number of arrests starts to peak in uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, November. And this is where we see the protest demands derating. So instead of mobilizing to make a political claim, uh, you start with a small protest, the, the regime, uh, police or, or security forces will arrest a few uh, activists, and then you have two or three days of people just mobilizing for the release of those activists, not making political claims anymore. And so there's this kind of demand cycling that happens around, you know, uh, 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 the arrests themselves. Of course, there's repression as well, and it took, uh, and so it was uh, non-state repression. So there are many groups uh, armed. Uh, I mean, the, the one that we, probably most of you have heard about are Hezbollah and Hakimaman, but other parties have also done that. So the the, uh, the PSP, the, the Socialist Party, the other parties have also deployed the same tactic in their regions against uh, protesters. What is interesting is that we see the state deploying the army and the police forces to protect the banks, which is interesting in a scene where the banks have stolen people's money. What does the state do? They deploy the army to protect the bank from the people. 
right? Uh, and this has become very common. Uh, uh, and then, of course, they have uh, uh, violence uh, or repression from uh, the security forces. Uh, towards the protesters. Uh, it, it reached, it, Lebanon was not as violent as the other cases, not like Iran, where we see hundreds of deaths, but we have high numbers of uh, um, injuries, and we see that there are tactics that are used from uh, the security forces that we see in other places, like targeting ICE, for example, which was a tactic we have very much used in, uh, in Lebanon. <laughs> now, once COVID started and uh, we were uh, pushed back to our homes and we had to, uh, you know, uh, empty the streets, uh, this is a photo I've taken on day seven of the lockdown, uh, uh, when the first day they allowed us to go for a walk. So this is in front of the central bank. So I walked all the way from, from my home to the central bank and then downtown where the protests were. And uh, I realized that they have actually physically erased the fact that there was a, there was a revolution here. So they, they erased, they just sprayed over the graffiti and they removed, this was full of tents and uh, all the things. So while we were uh, at home, they were, they were doing their job. Fast forward to uh, August, 2020. Uh, this is, I think, a very important turning point because uh, the, the August 4 explosion uh, made people realize that this, this regime is way more uh, difficult to talk to them than we thought, but also they thought, uh, you know, moved from a national to a regional international uh, uh, level. Uh, what happened is that most of the revolutionaries who had become part-time revolutionaries, by August they had become humanitarian workers. Uh, they were either cleaning up after the explosion or distributing food and so, and, and I've attended a lot of those meetings uh, that were initially organizing for, you know, for, uh, for revolution uh, politically. And by, by that time, all these meetings were all about how do we distribute food? How do we get people shelter, et cetera, right? So, uh, so it has turned into a, a disaster that became you know, almost beyond politics. It also got uh, internal, internationalized, as I said, hours after the explosion. Uh, this guy, who you probably know, showed up uh, and uh, he was promising to save the Lebanese people. And actually, people were running after him in the street saying, please colonize us again. Mm -hmm. uh, but what they did not know was uh, on August 8th, this was August 8th, was four days after the explosion, and this was the last big protest in Lebanon. Uh, and that protest was the most repressed. Uh, and, uh, and it was really a turning point. Uh, what uh, Amnesty International and other human rights organizations have shown that is that most of the, uh, uh, the tools of repression of the Lebanese state come actually from the French. Uh, France was, had donated, uh, you know, not just tear gas, but rubber bullets and other things. Uh, so at the same time that we were promised to be saved, uh, apparently they were having other deals uh, the table. Uh, a year later, just to wrap up here today, we are in a situation, there's a, there's a deadlock uh, on all levels, things are really uh, difficult. Uh, there was there, we had elections last, last year, we had some MPs uh, who were uh, elected. Unfortunately, individuals with no real organization uh, behind them, so they don't really have mobilization power, they can't mobilize the street. Uh, they're, by now, they're all divided amongst themselves, uh, so they started as one block, today they are four or five. Uh, and uh, what we see is that they have also shifted from a rhetoric at the beginning when they ran for elections, it was we, we, we need to be inside the system to stop, to block it, to disrupt, to, right? What they ended up doing is things like this. Right? lighting candles in the parliament. And so it's more symbolic than, uh, than anything else. And that's because power does not really lie anymore in, uh, in the parliament. So uh, I'll stop here with this uh, graffiti that says we want everything. <laughs> and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. So thank you both for these really interesting uh, overviews of the revolutions. Um, I would like to start with your personal experiences in the revolutions. So Dr. Mejid, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your experiences in organizing the protests? Um, what was the process like? How did you start organizing them? 
uh, how what was your experience being on the ground and did you receive any backlash or any threats for your participation? And Dr. Kadivar, what was it like to be as part of the diaspora uh, when the protests uh, started in Iran? And what role does the diaspora play? Because there's a really large diaspora, Iranian diaspora in many countries. So what role does that, can the diaspora play constructively? Who goes first? Um, you can go first. Okay. <laughs> um, well, yeah, uh, th thank you for the question. I was involved uh, as, a, as an organizer and that's, uh, I've been studying uh, protests and uprisings for, uh, for a long time. And I didn't expect a revolution to happen in Lebanon. So on October 18, I woke up in the morning and I was like, oh shit, we don't have unions. <laughs> so, uh, so I started to organize around labor and we tried to create uh, alternative uh, unions, professional unions, but also uh, workers unions, and we're working with students. Um, it was a very difficult and uh, probably, I mean, thinking back now, we were probably a bit naive in the sense that we thought we you, we could build once um, a revolutionary situation has already started. I think the lesson is that the most pre-organized is the one that is going to, uh, to take over. It's very hard to build because a day is 24 hours and you know between creating bylaws and a structure for the organization and between thinking about what we do politically uh it's almost impossible to do it um i wouldn't say i we, I, we were i was threatened but of course i mean these are very difficult processes uh um and um um you know and and in that case i think there was, there was repression from business owners rather than the state necessarily and this is the counter revolution that we probably don't talk about a lot but uh um even like private universities uh, uh, uh you know uh, uh so um so it's it wasn't easy but uh but i think it was a very rich experience and one that um highlights the importance of pre-existing organizations uh, in times of, of uprising, or at least to scaffold a, a transitional period. Uh, because we did not have that, so Lebanon's unions generally are co-opted since the 90s, and Lebanon has a very vibrant NGO sector, but not a political civil society, uh, so no political parties that are uh, well organized, uh, which made it very difficult to agree on a, so we couldn't agree on the leadership uh, and uh, actually we did not, people did not want a leadership. They thought that this is bad uh, or an organization, which uh, which was one of the main weaknesses of, of the movement. Hope it answers. Yes, thank you. Dr. Kodibar. Uh, yeah, so as just part of the diaspora, I was also watching every day. So we would, you would wake up and you were, you were tied to these phones to see what is happening on the other side of the world. And yeah, it was overwhelming. And everyone, including me, I was thinking what I can do. Everyone was trying to do something here. Um, so that's, I guess, the more personal side of it. Um, so my role as a sociologist, uh, someone who talks sometimes about these issues in uh, public sphere as well. Um, so some of, I think I was able to share some of my views about it. And at times it was not what the people who were very keen about the revolution, it was not what they wanted to hear because uh, they wanted to hear this is a big revolution. This is going to succeed very soon. And when we said this is gonna take time, it's not the victory or the outcome is not for granted. Um, not just me, but other people also got some pushbacks being accused of being reformist or pro-regime and so on and so forth. This is unfortunately a part of the how at least the online uh, sphere uh, transformed during these moments of you're either with us or you're uh, with them. Um, now that the protests have subsided, I see there's more, I think, opening for analysis, discussion, contemplation, and uh, criticism. In terms of diaspora, this was uh, a think, feature of these protests that the connection that was made with diaspora. This has happened before also during the Green 
uh, uprising of 2009, also Iranian diaspora mobilized outside the country. Uh, this was large, and so they did a lot, and they brought this to a lot of global platforms. I think people all around the world found out at least for some days or a, week, a few weeks about what was happening in Iran. But in some ways, also, I think the diaspora has derailed, derailed the movement and has not been uh, productive for the movement. Uh, so uh, elements of far right are much more vocal during diaspora, the, the monarchies, the ultra-nationalists, um, much more vocal than, so th th there was a, another difference between this episode and the last two episodes. In the last two episodes, there were some slogans in support of the monarchy, pre-79 monarchy in Iran. During the Jina, I mean, the protests, there was none. And this was, it was everyone, all of us were surprised how this took such a progressive turn from like some slogans in support of the monarchy. We had slogans coming from the Kurdish area, women like freedom. I mean, and all my political like all I hear slogans are death to this or death to that. Even in this episode, the most common slogans that you uh, people had was death to dictator and then death to Khamenei. So still death is number one. But then we also had this uh, one slogan, which is about life. And I mean, one, one can speak a lot about this, this slogan. So this was significant. The progressive turn was significant. But as the move, the protests subsided, uh, the diaspora leaders or people who want to put themselves in the position of leadership have become uh, more vocal. So those voices have become uh, more salient. In terms of a strategy, I think a big part of diaspora also and discourse, again, they, they also engage in this type of discourse, a big, I think, shortcoming of this movement, similar, I think, to what Remo was saying about Lebanon and other is that they just focus on the wrongdoing of the regime. So this regime is corrupt, this regime is criminal, so on and so forth. Okay, I mean, they're so bad, it's very easy to just talk bad about what they have done. But clearly this did not mobilize enough people to, for a regime change that this that they were calling. I talked about the breadth and how widespread the movement is, but at any given day participation didn't go beyond tens of thousands of people. This is not enough for a for to create a revolutionary situation. I don't think even a revolutionary situation was uh, created. And I think part of it is the shortcoming of this discourse. Um, again, if it's uh, people want to know that they're going to be able to live, that the next people who come to power will be able to manage the country, will be able to govern. So just talking about how bad Islamic Republic is clearly has not convinced people that the next people will have better governing uh, abilities. So I think they, is, they have engaged until now in the, this type of discourse. They talk now more about what they want, what they vision. And a lot of emphasis on asking the foreign governments to put sanctions, to just do the revolution for Iranians, which I think for a lot of them, there's this underlying assumption that Iranians on themselves cannot have a revolution. So we have the paradox of these people who call themselves revolutionaries, but all of their emphasis is to bring the Western governments to do something uh, for the Iranian people. If they truly believe their a revolution is possible in Iran, then their strategy should be to focus on to ask questions well, how can we bring large numbers to the streets because the numbers those numbers have not come to the street especially to in tehran i mean if you want a revolution you need 500,000 people out in tehran even millions and 500,000 would show there is a change it's not going to change the government and even if you million then you need a strategy you need to know what to do where to stay um so this is a it has a long way to go to turn to a revolutionary situation. Sometimes those things happen fast, for, but for the steps to come in, this is what is needed. And I say a lot of uh, diaspora is just uh, misguided in their uh, strategic vision of uh, what to do and like who, uh, what are the priorities. Thank you. So you've touched a little bit upon um, some lessons learned and some, some uh, things that went wrong and some things that should uh, happen in the future. So what are some lessons that you might have for some revolutionaries? If a revolution were to break out in what, a country that, you know, we have people from many different countries here. Uh, 
Yeah, that's uh, that's the million dollar question. Right? Uh, well, I think I've come to terms with the idea that revolution that revolutions uh, will most probably fail in the sense that these are very long term processes that uh, will you know people will not just mobilize and within days or weeks or even months uh, uh, change the whole regime unless unless it's a coup, right? Uh, so, uh, so I think, I mean, one important lesson is, is time is important, but organization is, is key. Uh, and organization uh, is something that requires a lot of work in, in non-revolutionary times. So, uh, so, so this means that people get excited when, they're, when there are big numbers in the streets and this is when they get engaged. But if we're disengaged in other days, uh, those moments when they come are, most probably going to be missed opportunities. Um, so the, the lesson I would say is organize uh, as much as you can for whatever uh, uh, you know causes you think are relevant uh, uh, to you because revolutions happen uh, unexpectedly, right? You, we don't know when, and it's you know it's a very complex and there are many factors that come in. Not saying if you have an organization, you'll definitely succeed, but at least it's important to have those networks in place it's important to have people who are you know who are close to each other politically and on this point i just want to also highlight the uh, you know organization is important but we think that it's cumulative and if we look in lebanon for example we had a big movement in 2005 after the assassination of hariri 2011 uh, when the Arab uh, uprising started, Lebanon had, uh, you know, a wave of mobilization. We had 2013 when uh, the public sector workers also mobilized for, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a few months. And then 2015 with the trash crisis. Uh, so, you know, there were all these waves. And of course, there was some kind of, uh, you know, accumulation, but there was also a lot of, um, activist networks that were shattered in this process, people not trusting each other again, that was very bad to the movement. When the uprising happened, people were just sitting, you know, looking at each other, not knowing whether they should talk to each other or not, because they had, pre in the previous cycles, they had uh, fallouts. So, uh, so networks break, they don't always, uh, you know, just uh, expand. And this is something that we also need to think about. And, uh, you know, and organizing when we fight, we should maybe, uh, think of uh, you know leaving some room for uh, for if if something major happens uh, we should be able to work together if we are all in the same on the same side of wanting a sort of change uh, yeah and just to say some activist circles can become very toxic and this is this is bad for movements. Well, I couldn't agree more for with what uh, Rima said about organizations. I read a whole, wrote, wrote a whole book, written a whole book about it uh, in the context of uh, other uh, democratic movements. <clears throat> but this is also the case with uh, Iran's uh, protests inside the country organization. It is organizationally very weak, and a big part of it is due to repression. Uh, the government even targets uh, a charity if they see it's growing in law, growing. Uh, becoming larger, they're becoming widespread. There was a big charity, Imam Ali, and then they were very successful in fighting against poverty and they just disbanded it a few years ago just because it was becoming very successful. But on the other hand, we also have the diaspora, which is very disorganized. So, I mean, in, in inside Iran, we can blame repression, but what is our excuse uh, outside Iran? So we have leaders and cliques and informal networks, but we don't have strong organizations. The only strong organization we have outside Iran, MKO, Mujahideen al you might have heard about, which is a cult totalitarian organization, which is not for any of the values, I think, that people have been protesting for in this uh, episode. I think we're going to take some questions from the audience. And uh, please introduce yourselves as well. Uh, hi, Dan Roberg, uh, the government department, and a shout out to Ali, who I haven't seen in a long, long time. Uh, um, there, we've, we've been using a lot of different words here, uprisings, movements, revolutions, revolutionary movements, and I think we need some more precision. 
what do we mean by a revolution? What do we mean by a revolutionary movement? What do we mean to be a typist in the morning or a revolutionary at night? I sound like I'm Karl Marx speaking here for a moment. But I think we need to be a bit more precise because, um, you know, revolution, successful revolutions, you can count on one hand. Um, revolutionary movements, you can count a lot, and many of them fail, right? So often it's the failures that really tell us a lot of a lot about what's going on. So I think we need a bit more precision. I'd really be happy to hear from both speakers about what, what they mean, what we mean by revolution, what we mean by revolutionary movements, what we mean by an uprising, what we mean by intifada. Well, what are these things? How do we define them and how are they relevant to the cases? And the other thing I, the related question I have is in terms of um, strategy, uh, revolutions are by definition efforts to up, uh, to overthrow the social order and establish another one. The term doesn't mean much if we really don't think about an effort to, to have that kind of revolutionary change. But the other strategy for uh, people who are engaged in movements and revolts is to raise their leverage and negotiate with elements in the state for some sort of political change, right? And uh, what part of the debate in the diaspora right now, and I, uh, and I hear it a lot from my Iranian friends and work with them on and off for about 10 or 15 years or more now, is it precisely about this question about whether we're talking about a revolutionary movement or whether the protest should try to find some interlocutors in the regime and the security apparatus and find some way of nudging it to something that would be far from revolution, maybe far from democracy, but would change the nature of how the regime operates. So that may be utopian, maybe it's not uh, it's, it's not possible, but certainly the division in the Iranian diaspora here in the United States is around partly precisely that question. Uh, so I'd like to hear more, uh, particularly from our Iranian speaker, about sort of how, how he envisions the conditions under which uh, political revolts can find uh, interlocutors in the regime. There's been a lot of talk in the last two months about divisions within the Revolutionary Guards, tensions in the regime itself. Are these sort of openings or are they simply irrelevant? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. So on the first question, uh, so I would, yeah, I would say yes, this is a revolutionary movement just in the sense that people in it, they call for a revolution, they want a revolution. It's a revolutionary episode by the definition that Mark Beisinger has the, done his book and his data set. Um, other, so the more famous definition also is revolutionary situation that Tilly and Taro have used. They say masses of people participate, but I don't know but if tens of thousands is masses of people or we need hundreds of thousands or uh, millions. I don't think, I think masses of people, I mean, this is my opinion here, it's not clear, but I think uh, the tens of thousands, you cannot have a revolutionary situation in Iran on a day definitely should be hundreds of thousands and or millions. I think until a revolutionary movement has not reached that level of participation on a given day, not a spread out. You can have hundreds of thousands come in like 20 days. It doesn't make much of it. It shows that movement is sustained, but it doesn't show that show of force. So until they can't bring hundreds of thousands and millions on a given day, we don't enter into a revolutionary situation. At least that's how I understand it in Iran in terms of the regime locutors. So one thing that is clear on the top of the regime is uh, it's very quite unified. Uh, the ones that are decision makers, they are all hardliners. They have supported the current policies. So there is, no, I mean, even Rouhani is not a decision maker today. Hatami is outside government. So they don't, these are not people that we, like the movement can rely on. So there's, I don't think much hope on the top, but uh, there was a leaked document of a meeting that Khamenei uh, had with the commanders of the Revolutionary Guards, the top commanders and middle commanders. And there were, there's a lot of contention coming from the middle commanders, uh, according to that document. The top commanders have been fully in support. Um, I think the movement can and should uh, try to at least not threaten everyone within the regime and also offer opportunities for future. If they're threatening that we are gonna kill everyone and they're ever going to, everyone is going to be punished and so on and so forth. And that is all the discourse that is going to just un unify them even more. 
but you don't want to just corner your opponent. You also want to put an exit ramp for them. And that's something I've written about in Farsi and also uh, suggested. And that is, I think, the only way that the repressive apparatus can be neutralized in Iran. Um, Iran is a very interwoven uh, society. So these commanders, they have families and their families, they are all these families and relatives, they're all not like pro-regime. Everyone in like Iranians in their family, they have pro-regime, anti-regime, religious, non-religious. If you go a couple of degrees of separation further from uh, your own circle. So organizing within, I think, informal networks is very important. And I think that's how movement activists can reach uh, around the, at least the middle rank commanders and bureaucrats uh, within the regime. Um, yeah, so I think, yeah, it's important more, I think, for the middle ranks. The top, I don't have like much hope, but then I think middle ranks start falling, then you, you might see also cracks at the top as well. But this is also part of the discourse that I was criticizing in terms of diaspora and even some of the elements of uh, protesters in Iran. There's a lot of anger. There's a lot of, I mean, I understand, of course, the regime is cruel. They have killed more than 500 people. They have tortured a lot of people. According to their own numbers, 22,000 have been arrested. I'm sure more, tens of thousands of arrests. Many people have lost their eyes. So Mirima was mentioned injury in Iran. There are people who have been killed. There are more that have been injured and have been arrested and uh, kidnapped and tortured and so on. So there are all the reasons for people to be as angry as they want to be and they can be. But the question is that how much how that anger should be channeled and whether that is constructive and whether that takes us to the goal or take the protesters to their goals. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dan, for the question. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a debate that is ongoing. And I think there's the, the, the multitude of terminology is a symptom of something, right? And uh, that is, I think that everyone is trying in the literature at least, to wrap their heads around what does a revolution mean in today's world, right? Uh, what we're, we're always comparing to the late 19th century, early 20th century, while knowing that the nature of revolutions today is actually very different because the nature of society is different than the nature of, what does, what does a, a social uh, a change or the, a change of social order mean in a globalized world, in a world like the one we live in today? So I think there's, uh, a, a, we're all trying to, update our theoretical toolbox there. And, and uh, you know, from, uh, uh, so by Basinger talks about the revolutionary episode or uh, uh, Tilly uh, talks about the revolutionary situation where there's a dual power. And I, and I use that terminology because I think in the case of Lebanon, there was a short window where there was dual power. Uh, or a situation of uh, somehow dual power. You know, the La Porta will talk about a, a revolutionary rupture. So, uh, uh, so it seems to be a, pro a process that is less clear in, in its um, uh, outcomes in terms of, and, th and this is why, I mean, most of these people are pushing against, uh, and, I, and I subscribe to this literature, against the, sub against the consequentialist approach of a revolution is a revolution when it, when it succeeds, right? What, what about those that fail? Uh, so do we consider that the efforts and the people who die in these processes are not revolutionaries because the, the political process or the social order did not change the way we would want it to change? And, and uh, so this is why I, I think I would like to hold on to the revolutionary in it and to continue thinking about how do we precise theoretically and conceptually what, what is a revolution today? Is it fair to say that the protesters in Lebanon and this movement, the trash movement and so on, are fundamentally opposed to the sectarian system? I mean, would that be a fair, or certainly want to, to take apart a lot of the existing sectarian system? They so want that's to- not a, 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 a description of their goal, their aspirations. No, the aspirations are there. Yeah. I think the question of, the sectarian aspect is more complicated because it's it's a sectarian regime. So even if there's a desire, unless the regime falls, people will eventually. So this is what we saw, right? When it when when things started to shift, people went back to their sectarian. Uh, so if we look at the uh, elections of uh, syndicates in the past year, 
the beginning, after 2019, almost all of them, it was the opposition or the, the revolution candidates that won the, those elections. The past year and a half, it's back to the sectarian parties. Um, and, you know, we, we can talk more about why if you want, uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that people who are sectarian or are anti-sectarian. Right. And you had a question as well? Yeah. Hi, uh, I am Mahmoud from Zika State, master student. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I think there is a there is a sense of uh, lost hope in those revolutions that are only based on grievances and that are, are horizontal, horizontally made, that uh, no horizontality has its, its, its benefits of getting people mobilized, like getting people into the streets, because everybody shares the same feeling, but that puts a limitation on the imagination of what's, <clears throat> what should happen next. And the sense that there is like a tendency for or, or hope for revolutions that are, that are based, that have some kind of vanguardism, not necessarily in the ministers, but like in the concept itself. But that imagine that the, that the revolution that have been well organized, that has this some, uh, uh, that has some sort of vanguardism and that has some sort of agenda and imagination of what's happening next. How does that revolution or that group or that organizers or, or whatever, maintain unity or maintain some sort of control of the situation in the face of divisions, in the face of uh, counter-revolution forces and uh, such. Thank you so much. <laughs> Is that for me or for Rima? Uh, <laughs> so horizontalism, so that's the question. Did I understand it correctly about what horizontalism entails for these movements? How, so your question is how can, how can a horizontal structure maintain unity? Yeah, or, 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 or in the case of another revolution that has this some sort of organization that is voted for, how does that organization keep, keep its unity in the face of divisions, internal divisions in the face of counter-revolution forces, in the face of all of that. Imagining that the so next if there, is a, if there is a leadership, how can this leadership yeah. succeed? Uh. Well, I think uh, horizontalism is quite weak and vulnerable when it comes to those type of situations. I mean, horizontalism, as you said, is good for a fast and massive mobilization, but everything to do after that, horizontalism doesn't work very well for it. It comes to elections, you need political campaigns. Um, for also sustained mobilization, like if you want to or have a general strike, you need unions. I don't I, I don't know if like general strikes that are only organized through internet. Internet is good for big demonstrations, but doesn't work. There were a lot of calls for general strike in Iran, but it's very simple. You either, I think most situation you need unions, or a revolutionary situation has already emerged, then general strikes can emerge on top of that. This is what happened in uh, 78, 79 in Iran. Uh, we had strikes, but it, it was without unions. And there are not strong unions in Iran. There are some small uh, independent uh, syndicates here and there, uh, but nothing large to that extent. So yes, to for... For a movement, especially these movements that call for revolutionary change, so revolutionary change, one part of it is dismantling the current political order. The second step is to transition and install new institutions. Uh, so for dismantling, horizontalism could work, even though we know it even hasn't worked very well for that. Just probably for the first step of dismantling, it works. Um, but for transition, for making new institutions, participation in elections and so on, I think horizontalism has shown that it's not very effective. Uh, we need instead uh, formal organizations that have uh, mechanisms of accountability and uh, deliberation. Uh, so there should uh, and effective decision making. Problem with horizontalism is that it's they're not, it's not good for decision-making, easily can lead to 
uh, decision making paralysis when you also ask for when they require there should be a set consensus with everyone but a consensus just doesn't emerge in this situation and people should be ready to make accommodations and compromise we can't have everything we want and just go forward it's just impossible we can at least in this situation just agree about how we can disagree uh, with each other which is I think a huge step forward so I'll uh, quickly say, uh, well, first, it sounds like we lost hope, but I, I, I'm not sure we did. Uh, I mean, if you think about the French Revolution, one that is celebrated as the, you know, the revolution, this is, this is what we always go back to. If you looked at it 10 years into the French Revolution, it was a disaster, right? Uh, so it took, it took 80 years, eight decades for it to become a success. So I think, Thinking about the Arab uprisings, uh, even a decade later, is these are, this is a, a long-term process that is still unfolding. And you know, even talking about uh, the change in social order, I mean, the financial crisis in Lebanon has changed the social order. Uh, so, so there, so it's really a very deep transformation that is happening. Uh, on the question of if there is a leadership, I think the lessons are I mean, how one is that any leadership needs to have a social base. So when we talk about uh, labor, uh, it's not an old Marxist trope. It's just because labor, labor organization, neighborhood organization, what we've seen in Sudan. So you need social groups that are able to mobilize because we've seen a lot of parties that are too elitist. Most of them leftist, actually. There are like 20 intellectuals who meet and read every week, but they don't have any any link with, with the ground. So this doesn't work. This, this cannot become a vanguard uh, in, in that sense. Uh, the other thing I think is what we've learned is that we need full farmers and therefore we need to mobilize resources. When we build organization, we need people who are doing this as uh, you know professional politicians uh, and professional organizers, people who are really dedicated to, uh, to this type of work. Um, in order not to fall in this, uh, you know, the dynamics of we, you know, we we're revolutionaries on the weekend and uh, something else on, on weekdays. Um, yeah. Um, hi, I'm Anuja. Um, I'm in the Department of Government Conflict Resolution. Um, and I have two questions. So um, for the Iranian protests, I was just wondering about um, um, are there still ties with other Kurdish movements in other countries um, with the Iranian revolution? Um, and in Lebanon, I just have a question about what impact um, the protests had on intercommunal relations with the Lebanese and then also um, between Lebanese and the refugee population. Thank you. So the question was if there are ties with other college students? Wait, Kurdish movements. Kurdish um, movements? Yeah, in other countries. There were a lot of, uh, I think, uh, small or bigger events of solidarity that happened. Uh, there were some demonstrations. I think it was in some of the Kurdish areas of Syria and Turkey that they were uh, men and women were marching with the pictures of Gina Amini, and they, those were uh, they they, I, they were circulated widely on the social media in Iran. They were subtitled. Um, the, so the start of the movement was certainly because of this Kurdish connection. The Women Life Freedom slogan you probably all of you know by now. Uh, this came out of the the Kurdish women in Turkey. The first place and then traveled to Syria and then through the Kurdish women in Iran at the funeral of Gina Amini, Masa Amini, uh, as women took off their headscarves and put it on fire, they were also chanting women life freedom. So this, uh, this transnational connection through the Kurdish women, I think was very significant for the orientation and symbols and the main slogans of this movement. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, uh, do you see that there's still a connection with the other Kurdish movements or it's declined again? I have, no, I have not seen. I think it has okay. declined. 
but I think it would be good for the Iranian college students abroad to make connections. It wasn't my one recommendation to a lot of Iranians here that instead of just going talking to senators and so on and so forth, go talk to the activists and make connection with the activists. It would be more beneficial for the movement. Thank you. Yeah, on, on... On the Lebanon, uh, the impact on intercommunal relations, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a complicated impact because uh, it's not, it's not con contact theory. It's not that people come together and all of a sudden they start to like each other. Uh, so, uh, because the arrow goes in all sorts of ways. So there was sectarianization from the political parties that considered this. Uh, so for example, when Hezbollah said, this is a foreign conspiracy and these people are paid, Right, uh, we saw a, a shift there. We also saw the infiltration of some uh, uh, traditional Christian parties that became the leaders of the revolution uh, later on. So there's that. But of course, there, there, there's, these are times when there is a general feeling of the emergence of a Lebanese nation as one. Uh, so, uh, so that was definitely a, 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 you know a, an emotion that was fed, but that with time can go in different directions. The refugee question is very important and interesting because I think, uh, again, the, 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 the movement was not one. So there were people within the movement who were very xenophobic, uh, actually blaming the financial crisis on uh, the refugees. Uh, but there were also others who were very supportive of, of the uh, refugees. The, the interesting part is that the refugee voices themselves were missing. They did not mobilize uh, uh, in big numbers during the uprising. So the Palestinians were mobilizing before. When the uprising started, they, they retrieved. Uh, the Syrians barely mobilized. They're not organized, but also we did not see. And I, I, I've been doing some work on, on this. Of course, it's understandable, many reasons. Uh, they're very vulnerable in, in, in Lebanon. Many of them are not legally uh, you know, residents and therefore they're afraid of, you know, these are spaces where there's a lot of police and, uh, but also there's the trauma of the Syrian revolution. And many people say, were saying that they were afraid when it started uh, because it's like seeing something that happened to them all over again and, and fearing that it can turn violent. And um, so it's the effects I think would require more uh, in-depth analysis. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, I'm uh, Daoud. I study public policy here at the Code School. Our school is very data-driven, so uh, that which takes me to my question where you said the all demographics about the protesters, right? Uh, I was curious, how did you uh, collect all that data? Because in, in the times of uh, the revolution, I think it must be difficult. To uh, start, uh, Dr. Ali, uh, uh, my question is that thanks so much for saying all of those things about the diaspora. I think this, that's very important. Uh, right now, uh, Afghans are in the same stage. There is a very big uh, diaspora organization frenzy going on without realizing that we need to have a, a good goal and stuff like that. Uh, but as Afghans, we look uh, to the case of Iran because if there is going to be any change in Iran, I think that will influence Afghanistan. And that is why we pray and uh, we pray that there is a good change in Iran. So how do you see that? Do you think that any change if coming in Iran would influence the region, uh, in particular Afghanistan? You're muted, Ali. So you're right. This time, the protests in Iran started inspired protests in Afghanistan. A lot of uh, women also protested the Taliban's ban on women going to schools, even the, in diaspora and also in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I agree. If some change happens in Iran, just because of the shared language and shared history, it would have influence in Afghanistan. Uh, so we have shared culture, but in terms of infrastructure, the two countries are very different, I would say. For example, the level, like the urbanization is much higher in Iran. Uh, uh, Afghanistan is still like the majority rural or something close to that. And that is why we see a movement like Taliban and like insurgent movement in rural areas can succeed in there. So 
I, I wouldn't say the same strategy would work, but I also think if something positive, a democratic change happens in Iran, it could have spillovers uh, to Afghanistan and the rest of the region. Is there a prospect right now for that? I mean, not in the government. The government doesn't seem like they want to make any political openings. The opposition is disorganized, although some people are pondering about what to do uh, differently, what to change. Um, um, what I probably would happen again is that the grievances are there. The regime is not making concessions. And I think this is everyone's sense that protests will break out again at some point, at somewhere. Uh, we don't know that. We don't know how broad it will be and what it will turn into. But we could just end up repeating the current situation, going through these episodes of protest, when protesters are not able to bring large population into the streets, the government uses violence, it creates more grievances, more hatred toward the regime. And this, I don't know how, how long this can be repeated, um, but that I think looks the most uh, likely scenario unless one of the actors change their behavior. And, and that is possible also. I mean, actors can make mistakes or make stupid mistakes. Uh, so it's not, I'm not, certainly making any predictions here but yeah, about what is the outcome, but I think we'll probably see more of these protest episodes because the root causes are there and the previous episode showed that repression doesn't just stop them. They, they bring down the protests at the moment, but it may take one year, two years, three years. If the, when the situation doesn't change, then we have an option of protests elsewhere. Uh, the survey was collected on uh, protest sites. Um, so we were, so it's a survey that uh, uh, we had, the sample size was 1,200 almost. Uh, and the, uh, so the method was uh, data collection from protest sites. So we, so we only sampled protesters. We didn't do, it's not a household survey or, a, uh, and uh, it's uh, uh, relative to the size of, so we mapped the squares and the size of uh, the protests in each square, and we uh, we collected data accordingly. And I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, so we have a couple of questions from the online audience. So I don't, I'm just going to put these up here. So. Uh, we let Ali go see and maybe take a look and, and each offer an answer to as you wish. So the first set of questions are about how the I think government provides for revolutionary guard. I think that it's an important question. I think the government has been focused to provide for their uh, repressive apparatus. Um, other public servants have gone on protest for not unpaid wages, but we haven't seen such thing among the police or. Uh, revolutionary guards and so on. Uh, the, even the Basij, for example, has been exempted from taxes at the same time that the government has raised taxes on business owners and private sector. So uh, the part of I said about the increasing corruption and decline of effectiveness, you can see it in this side. Uh, repression has become a very major axis of Iranian uh, government for their survival. So there are a lot of investment uh, on that. And they are selling enough oil the, the output has decreased, but the price of oil to their luck has increased. Um, so they sell enough oil to just pay for their uh, for the police, for revolutionary guards, for agents of repression. And we know it's that at the end of the game, what the, re the re repressive apparatus, the decision they make is a big uh, game changer. In terms of what international community can do, they can... Uh, I mean, I signed a letter to the UN to have an investigation to condemn the crackdown and repression. So the international community should stay vigilant and even, uh, I think, targeted sanctions and about human rights issues. They are not going to, I think, disable the repressive apparatus, but they don't. I think that at least the international community should show that they care. Um, I mean, the, the economic sanctions, I think it's a more uh, sophisticated uh, situation. The oil sanctions certainly has uh, affected Iran's economy in negative ways. There is also banking sanctions. Uh, Iran is basically disconnected from the banking system. If I want to send 
like money to my brother in Iran, I can't because there is no banking system. This one particularly, I think it has hurt the government, but it has also hurt the protesters. People call for a general strike, but a general strike for people that are wage earners, like day to day, they have to go uh, put in work to like bring things to their table. It's not a practical idea. And it is impossible for diaspora. We have a wealthy diaspora and like the Iranian diaspora. So they can send money and like provide backing and funds for a struck, but there is no banking system. So they have to just find channels to smuggle man, money and so on and so forth. And there's research that shows that remittances uh, undermine uh, authoritarian rule and uh, through like uh, make people more dependent, more resourceful people can protest and so on. So the question of, I think, sanctions is complicated. And unfortunately, there has not been enough patience to speak about it among the Iranian diaspora. As soon as you question the sanctions, you get attacked as being a pro-regime or reformist, or like whitewasher, so on and so forth. Um, but yeah, I think it's a uh, complicated questions and sanction by sanctions, the outcomes are different. Well, uh, that is all the time that we have for tonight. Thank you everyone uh, watching and in person for coming. And uh, please join me in uh, thanking our two panelists for the time.